So, your friend buys you this game called Teardown. From the name, you assume it's about destroying things, and as you start the first mission, you're tasked with taking down this house. You have a vague idea of what kind of destruction levels to expect from other games you've played. So, equipped with only a sledgehammer, you approach the house, you swing, and... D did I just take out a chunk of the wall? Wait, I I've seen destruction before, but not to this degree. And at that point, you start wondering. Can I destroy everything in this game? What about the ground? Wait, can I drive that? Holy mother of... I wonder if I can take down that entire block of flats over there. And that right there is the moment you find yourself enveloped by that strange and exciting feeling I call the sense of wonder. This video was sponsored by Menscape, the definitive hygiene package designed specifically for the target audience of my videos apparently. I got here with me the Perfect Package 4.0, which is an all-in-one men's grooming kit for body hair removal from head to toe. It comes with a lawnmower 4.0, which is a lovely little cordless and waterproof shaver with an LED light and skin safe technology that prevents nicks and cuts when you use it to remove hair anywhere on your body. Also included in the package is the Crop Preserver Liquid Deodorant and the Crop Reviver Toner Spray. Oh, and I was told that for a limited time, if you get the perfect package at menscape.com, you'll get two little gifts. One being this shed travel bag to carry everything around easily, which by the way works lovely with a travel mode on the lawnmower, tap the button on the front three times to turn that on. And the second gift is the Manscaped anti-chafing boxer briefs. They are made out of a microfiber blend which helps with the process of writing scripts about game design analysis. I think. So get 20% off plus free shipping when you use the code CHECKPOINT at manscaped.com. Thanks again Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Oh, also a huge thanks to CJ from What's With Games who helped co-write this video. Make sure to check out his stuff on YouTube. Now, back to the video. So it seems that that sense of wonder comes from games that make you believe that anything is possible. That is a tricky mindset to put your players in and it's a mindset you probably found yourself in as a kid, back when the main driving force behind you playing games was your own sheer curiosity. I remember playing World of Warcraft, a game that doesn't really focus on mobility. But as a curious kid, I often found myself thinking, I wonder if there's anything at the top of that hill. And after struggling to get up there, my mind was blown to find out that there was actually something up there. And moments like that are the fuel for that kind of curiosity and they encourage players to ask more questions like, I wonder if… This question right here seems to be the main ingredient in the soup of evoking a sense of wonder in players. It's about embracing that childlike state of mind and allowing your curiosity to take the wheel from the hands of rationality. There actually is a game that's 100% about cultivating curiosity and I'm working on a video about it, so make sure to stay subscribed for that one. I also remember when I played an early version of Minecraft in 2010, back when there wasn't really a tutorial or much guidance to begin with, so I found myself asking that question constantly. Okay, I can punch dirt, but I wonder if I can also punch that tree over there. Oh, wow. Okay, I figured out how to make a shovel, but I wonder if I can use different materials to make... Oh, I actually can. Nice. I wonder what happens if I keep digging down. Oh. Now, depending how old you are, you've probably also experienced this going from 2D platforming games to entire 3D worlds, realizing that you can now explore in a whole new dimension. And more recently, a similar shift in perspective happened with VR games, when my mind was overwhelmed by all the possibilities when I realized that I can simply pick up and interact with every object around me. I just realized that by more recently, I mean six years ago. Man, I feel like an old fart. The thing is, huge leaps in perspective like those are very rare, so we cannot rely on them if we want to evoke those emotions in our games. And since that sense of wonder is not exactly an asset you can buy from the asset store, as designers we have to rely on something else if we want to figure out how to inject that into our games. And I think we do that by analyzing what breaks that sense of wonder. So 
So you've probably noticed how my examples are quite old, and there's a reason why I keep bringing up the theme of this showing up in our early gaming days. And that's because I think there's a strong correlation between your gaming literacy and being able to feel that sense of wonder. It seems that the enemy here is your knowledge of how games work. As you play more games, you start seeing repeating design patterns, standards and tropes that are used in a lot of games. And becoming aware of those patterns make you approach new games with preconceived ideas and assumptions of how those games work. And sometimes you're not even aware that you're doing that. For example, which one of these doors can you open? Of course, it's this one because it clearly has a 3D handle and the other one is a simple texture. At this point, your brain is hardwired to identify simply textured doors as just set dressing, while also knowing that you can interact with more detailed doors with the possibility of there being content behind them. I honestly, truly didn't think you'd fall for that. I know, it sucks, but with every game you play, you unwillingly build resistance against that sense of wonder. So basically, you get jaded. Have you ever had a nostalgia moment where you felt like playing a game from your childhood? So naturally, you go online and you tort, I mean buy it, and after you install it, you realize that it doesn't hold up to your fond memories of it. And that's because you have been exposed to years and years of new games, pushing the boundaries of the medium and desensitizing you to new design standards. So when you go back to your childhood games now, you do it with the hindsight of modern game design practices. And that's why a lot of games don't stand the test of time. <laughs> Since you're watching my videos, it's worth noting that it's even worse if you're a game developer. Having first-hand knowledge of what it takes to develop a game and how systems work behind the scenes gives you a perpetual resistance buff against feeling that sense of wonder. Which is basically a curse, because now as a game dev, when I play a game, I understand how much work it takes to add an easter egg in that distant spot over there, and given that the game's budget wasn't that high to begin with, it's incredibly unfair likely that there's any content there, so I don't even bother checking anymore. And as a result, this subconscious way of thinking sucks the fun out of most games out there. And this applies to any discipline. As soon as you get a grasp of how things work, you start consuming similar content from an analytical perspective rather than an entertainment one. So knowing what ruins that feeling of wonder, let's talk about how we can try to evoke it on purpose. It would be lovely if this was a Unity plugin you could drag and drop into your project, but it's not. So in my process of researching this, I came up with three design concepts that could help trigger that feeling of wonder, starting with obfuscating information. It's a bit confusing and vague, but it's basically the idea of withholding information from your players. Think about playing games before the internet was a thing. If you wanted to find out if there is anything hidden in the darkness of Devil Dagger's starting area, you had to find that on your own, by actually playing and experimenting experimenting with the game. You had to invest your own time in order to answer those curiosity questions, compared to nowadays where you are one search away from getting precise easter egg walkthroughs for any game really. There's a certain charm to having rumors and myths floating around the internet about your game, giving players something to look forward to even if it's not exactly gameplay content. I mean, try to look up the 17th Colossus and I think you'll understand. What I'm saying is, when you design your game, try not to spoon feed the player everything the game has to offer. Leave some things out on purpose, because your players will find those things eventually. And I don't know about you, but I get a certain adventurous feeling knowing that I have to step outside of the game on purpose in order to get info from a discord server or obscure forum so I can experience a little bit of extra content. It's like a meta easter egg hunt that happens around the the game. Undertale, Zardy's Maze and Five Nights at Freddy's are good examples of games that take full advantage of this concept. Hey, how you doing? Hey, what's going on? Oh my god! Alright, well that didn't go. Well, actually that went exactly how I thought it was gonna go.
The second design concept is about having a huge amount of content, and this can be tackled in two ways, starting with presenting that amount of content as the sheer scale of the game's world. Definitely not an easy or cheap thing to pull off, but we seem to experience that sense of wonder when we realized just how big the playing field is. Think of the first time you checked how high you can go in Minecraft by placing dirt blocks under you, only to find yourself staring at the virtually infinite landscape waiting for you to explore. Or leaving your home planet for the first time in No Man's Sky, as you realize that every dot of light on your screen is a planet that you can explore. Yeah, you already knew that from the marketing materials, but it hits differently after you spend an hour trying to fix your ship and you get to experience it firsthand with the music and the visual spectacle. Oh, and also this moment right here. What the fuck? What the f Holy shit! Oh my god! But obviously, procedurally generating a huge world without populating it properly is kind of pointless. So if your game doesn't have a randomly generated world, you can still use level design tricks to make your levels feel bigger. Like this section from the beginning of Half-Life 2, where you make your way through the apartment blocks and at this door you take a left and another left. This is the intended route and we all took it because we were subtly guided by the level design and this light right here. However, what is not immediately obvious is that you probably also registered that door that was on the right. It had 3D handles, so you know you could have opened it, but it's too late now since you already took the intended path, so it's going to stay in the back of your mind as an alternative route that could have been explored. However, if you actually go back, you'll find out that it's simply a dead end, added there in order to create the illusion of choice. And that's not the only one. Half-Life 2 is full of this type of level design tricks, making City 17 feel much bigger than it actually is. You could also present an abundance of content through the lens of mechanical possibilities. This is usually something that happens in systemic games that encourage emergent gameplay, like the stasis powers in Breath of the Wild, making the player realize how they can combine them to interact with the world around them. Or figuring out that the items in Binding of Isaac actually stack, so you start wondering about all the ridiculously overpowered combinations you could put together, which by the way, is a very intentional design choice. But probably the best example of sheer mechanical possibilities is Scribble Knots, a puzzle game where you write words in a magical notebook and they materialize into the game's world. And the secret design sauce is keeping puzzles vague on purpose while allowing for multiple solutions. Like this one right here, where you encounter a man in the desert and you're simply told refresh him. The first instinct is to obviously type in water bottle and hand it over to him, which works just fine, but then you find out that you get get bonus points for finding new solution words. So you start the level again and you try igloo, at which point you realize just how open-ended this approach is. Hat and water gun are also viable options, opening your mind to all the combinations possible in future levels. And finally, the third design concept is about focusing on the unexpected. Players get a sense of wonder when they experience something that they thought it wasn't possible for the game to do. This means designing content that intentionally subverts the player's expectations, and it works especially well if it subverts skepticism. You know, like when you played Dark Souls for the first time and you got wrecked by that dragon. Later on, you found your way under that bridge and you noticed that dragon's tail just chilling over there and a thought popped into your mind. I wonder if I can equip my bow and shoot good lord it actually works. And at a time when most games would not have a collision box on that tail, that is a prime example of subverting expectations. 
A very common way of achieving similar unexpected results is creating self-aware content, like breaking the fourth wall through writing. A great example of this is Stanley Parable, a game in which your decisions are guided by a narrator and the majority of its content comes from purposefully going against that guidance. Stanley Parable also fully embraces the concept of unexpected by subverting industry standards and going a step further to challenge everything we've learned from games we've played before. By the way, if you can think of any game that nailed down the unexpected kind of content, please mention it in the comments. I'm trying to make a list and your comment would be super helpful. Another great example of this would be Baba Is You, where its mechanics and levels are intentionally designed in such a way that they require you to actively rethink the way you interact with the game. And most often than not, the right solution to a level is the unexpected one. Now, when you break down this concept, you realize that it's simply about acknowledging the player's efforts when they don't expect the game to acknowledge them. And there is even a design term for this, called negative possibility space. And and a popular example of this is Super Mario Odyssey, where the developers knew that it's possible to climb all the way up this pillar, and they acknowledged the player's efforts by placing some coins there. This is a pretty easy thing to do in most games, and it's very effective because as soon as the player's efforts are acknowledged, they are encouraged to keep up those efforts. And that right there acts as fuel for that sense of wonder as their way of thinking kicks into curiosity mode, rationalizing thoughts like, if there was something all the way up this pillar, that means there might be something in other hard to reach spots in this game. And that way of thinking is something quite rare that we should cherish and hold on to. Because as we grow older, we're less likely to encounter that sense of wonder. So as players, it's important to consciously try to let go of our skeptical assumptions and allow ourselves to be immersed and carried by the game experience. Oh, and if you're a developer, whenever someone breaks your game and they reach a spot they weren't supposed to, make sure to add a little collectible there. One day, a player will really appreciate that. <laughs>